Hi, y'all. So about three weeks ago, my internet son, Vernaculus, hi, Vernaculus, uh, did a very good video responding to the Young Turks talking about the Second Amendment. I'm going to address that same video, parts of that same video, to address some things that uh, Vernaculus didn't bring up in his very good video, to which I'll leave a link below and come in to your good graces. So the Young Turks video um, was called, or is called, The History of the Second Amendment. A better name for it would be The False History of the Second Amendment. They're like the Encyclopedia Brown of, of lying. No lie is too small to tell. All right, uh, take, it, uh, take it away, sir. Well, I was tipped off to this story initially by Kod Kalinske, who does a great show on our network, Secular Talk. By the way, I've checked out his work product. I am similarly unimpressed, but I digress. Check it out. Uh, my old friend uh, Tom Hartman, uh, we used to do radio uh, together back in the day, wrote a really interesting article about uh, the origins of the Second Amendment. Now, uh, let's acknowledge in the beginning that, uh, of course, history is always nuanced, and there are many different components that go to, into any one thing, including this. It, I completely agree that history is nuanced in some parts. That said, there are still things that are definitively true and things that are definitively false. And some things that are true, along with other things, which when you leave out those other things, paints an inaccurate picture of what it is you're trying to describe, thereby misleading your audience. And if you've done research on these topics, then you should know, uh, even through a cursory search, of these other facts which you don't provide to your audience. Second Amendment. On purpose. And uh, how it came to be. So people do make legitimate points about how uh, there was the English Bill of Rights, and they talked about uh, the need for arms. They didn't want the, uh, the king to have all the arms. Well, that would create a, create a political problem for them especially among the different religions that quite often went to war in England. Uh, the English Bill of Rights of 1689 spoke about uh, Protestants being armed suitable to their conditions, which means class, uh, under law, which is uh, an advertence to parliamentary supremacy. Uh, the, su the parliament is supreme in all things. There's no written constitution. Uh, to call it a Bill of Rights is a bit of an overstatement. You should call it a Bill of Privileges. Now, of course, to be sure, when the American system came about, some things were incorporated wholesale from the British system. It was the instant government with which the Founding Fathers were most familiar, having lived under it, having been British themselves. Uh, and other things were incorporated with modifications to accommodate what it is that the, the uh, brand new um, United States of America wanted for itself that were different from England. One of which is a written constitution. Uh, among which uh, uh, among which provisions guarantees to people certain rights that are simply beyond the government's remit to uh, to dispense with at their whim, unlike in England. Now, we didn't have similar religious problems, but we did have issues between the North and the South and other ones here in the United States. And uh, it talks, of course, the Second Amendment does, <laughs> about a well-regulated militia. Uh, and there were militias in the North as well as the South. But the militias in the South were also had a different name. They were called slave patrols. Uh, no, not not uh, exclusively. In some of the uh, the southern colonies and states, uh, the slave patrols were taken from the militias, and in other parts, not so much. If you really want to tie something that's horrible, or you know, paint a picture between something that exists today and something at the time related to slave patrols, then you could bring up modern American policing. It, it's derivative straight from the Night Watch in the North and the slave patrols in the South, but you like law enforcement, so you don't want to play up that connection, whereas you don't like private citizens having their firearms, and therefore you do want to play up uh, the fact that the Second Amendment had something whatever to do with uh, slavery. Uh, and, and indeed, you'll say many false things related uh, to that false proposition. Uh, by, by the way, you talk about, we need to have a militia so we can have our slave patrols. Uh, that's why we need the Second Amendment, the arms. Uh, slave patrols, to be sure, were uh, often armed, and by often, I mean that uh, in the same sense that I mean to say that in the United Kingdom, law enforcement officers there are often armed. Not most of them, not most of the time. But in uh, a couple of years ago, when I started doing videos on this channel about gun rights, I had mentioned that, uh, as I was aware at the time, about four uh, different agencies in the United Kingdom apart from the special divisions that deal with protection and for the, the royal family and the ministers and dignitaries and whatnot, uh, routine police forces were uh, arming their officers full-time. Some of their officers were being armed 
full time, and that's because they worked out. When something bad happens, it is uh, not uh, especially expeditious to tell the officer, "All right, there's something bad happening here. Come back to the station. We'll open up the armory, give you a gun, you load it, and then you can drive there and deal with the bad thing." At the time, it was about four, of which I was aware, according to an article written by the BBC uh, last summer, I think in August. Um, it is now something like 42 are routinely arming their police officers. Anyway. Oh, so anyway. Uh, firearms often used uh, by slave patrols. Uh, not the common, I won't say issue because they weren't issued, but not the common um, equipment that was carried with them. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, like Elbridge, uh, Gary mentioned of a standing army. He compared it to an erection. It is, to be sure, a guarantee of uh, a good guarantee of domestic tranquility, but it is a terrible invitation to foreign adventure. Uh, you know, the firearm, like a standing army or a dick, just standing there provides a temptation to want to use it on something. And while it w may not have been a criminal statute in uh, some of the colonies and states for slave patrol members to kill slaves, there was still retribution to be meted out uh, to them if they killed someone's slave. Not because anybody cared about slave, uh, black people qua humans, it was black people qua property. And uh, if I can give an analogy of a horse, if a person, if you're like the horse rounding up patrol and someone's horse escapes, what you don't do is shoot the horse, drag the corpse back to the horse owner and say, hey, I brought you your horse back, you're welcome. Uh, so there are retributions that can be meted out to um, over exuberant slave patrolmen for damaging the property, uh, damaging these humans to such an extent that they could no longer do work. That that cut into the wages of, of the slave owner, who had uh, penalties of law you know, lawsuits he could bring. And uh, you know, back in back in the day, not all grievances were settled in courts of law. I will just point out. So there's an inbuilt incentive uh, for various reasons, none of which are particularly moral, but nevertheless they are there, and they were some protection against abuses being uh, visited upon the slaves by the slave patrols. Indeed, one of the observations about the, the lot of slaves during the Civil War is that when the going started getting bad and slave owners started being pulled into the military having to go fight, that the slaves lost the shield that they had against the excesses of people who would mean to do them harm. Now, to use the same kind of reasoning that you want to use here about later on about uh, if something is done, and one of its consequences is a certain thing, it was done specifically to bring about that particular consequence. That's what you're trying to do here with the uh, slave, slavery in the South. Because there was slavery in the South, and having militias allowed for the maintenance of that, that was the express reason that it was put into the Constitution, was just so we could have us some slavery. By that same kind of non-reasoning, the uh, United States, the Union Army, entered the war specifically to rob and rape slaves because that was one of the, the uh, injustices visited upon slaves in the war, being beaten, raped, and robbed by advancing uh, Union armies. And a lot of slaves are of the opinion, uh, the white devil I know or the white devil I don't know, thank you very much, I'll stick with the white devil whom I know. I know how Mars James is going to treat me. I know how Massa is going to treat me. These white motherfuckers from the north, they steal my pocket watch. They steal all the goods that I had. Uh, they rape our women. we They're bad. We don't want any part of them. Interesting. So, we're going to get to that in a second. First, let me read you what the Second Amendment says. It says, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, uh, today... Notice there are two clauses. There's a prefatory clause and then an operative clause. The prefatory clause adverts to the militia, obviously. And the, the operative clause says, the right, the thing which is guaranteed, uh, and then to whom it is guaranteed. It is the right of the people, and then what it consists of, to keep and bear arms. The reason that that is there is because they, they were familiar with the English Bill of Privileges from the 1689, or as it's otherwise known, as the English Bill of Rights. And they were aware that the king didn't go about getting rid of the militias by saying, all right, no more militias. We'll just simply start disarming people. That's why uh, the right is written in that particular way. Now, you seem to have a lot of confusion about the prefatory clause to include the language. You want to confuse the term of art, the term 
well regulated with the word regulation, as in government regulation, as in uh, lots of rules and an imposed hierarchy and all these kinds of things, and it doesn't mean anything of the sort. Well regulated is a term of art uh, that was just in the vernacular in, in the uh, 18th and even in the 19th centuries. And all it meant was that something functioned. Your mind, if you were you know, in control of your faculties, was a well-regulated mind. A, a, a watch that told the accurate time, a sundial that gave you the accurate time, was a, a well-regulated timepiece. It, it gave you an approximately true uh, statement of what time of day it is. Obviously, sundials don't work all that well in the night, for some reason. I think it's because the sun gets scared of us and goes to hide. It was frowning on slavery, that's what it is. So you want to mislead your audience, in this case I think it's just ignorance on your part, about a well-regulated militia. It didn't mean one that has lots of rules and lots of regulations and a whole bunch of order. It just means that it, it functions uh, in the way that a, fun that a militia should function. And the way that you guarantee that it functions is by giving the people their arms. Uh, modern conservatives interpret that as everybody gets to have any weapon they like, pretty much. And the Supreme Court has gone along with that. That is a naked lie. The Supreme Court explicitly does not go along with that. That's what the Miller decision is about. It, it allows for the regulation and the prohibition of unusual and dangerous weapons. I don't know <laughs> what constitutes a dangerous gun. I've, I've never met a gun that isn't dangerous, but whatever. Uh, and the, the Heller decision was very careful to disavow what you have claimed, and so too was the McDonald, which was just the incorporation of what was recognized in Heller, uh, incorporated and held applicable against the states. You're just lying there to your audience instead of misleading them out of ignorance. You're also uh, misleading them about strict constructionists. Most conservatives I know are like Justice Scalia. They reject the term strict constructionist because it's moronic and it, commits, it logically commits you to things that are stupid. For example, an, ex uh, an example Justice Scalia gives, and I know you lie about Justice Scalia and say that he claims to be a strict constructionist. He finds that to be a very uh, tedious insult. And the example he gives is, is this. If you read the plain language of the First Amendment, it preserves the right to free speech and the right of the free press, of a free press. So that would mean, logically and legally, that the Congress should have the power to be able to prohibit handwritten letters because they are neither speech nor the press. They're not something you're saying with your mouth, you know, speaking, and it's not something where the ink got on the parchment or the page by use of a mechanical press. It's something you've written by hand, and another example he gives is laying hands on a priest. By the plain, plain terms of the statute, it would be unlawful to shake hands with a member of the clergy, except that's not what it means. Uh, lay on hands does not mean to touch. It means to accost, to assault and batter. In the same way that it's not freedom of speech as in freedom to speak, it's the freedom of speech. It's the right of expression, which uh, very commonly takes the in the form of speech and very commonly uh, comes through the press, but not exclusively, and all those other things are just as much protected as is the right to speak and the right to uh, use a press to print things to distribute publicly. Uh, now, the reality is, <laughs> the first part of the amendment says, a well-regulated militia being... A functioning militia being necessary to the security of a free state, you can't disarm the people who make up the militia. It goes together beautifully. It's almost like the people who wrote that were smarter than you. Necessary. So that is a very important qualifier because back then they had militias and they didn't want the United States government to take over all the militias that they had. The point was militias, not, hey, Bob down the street gets to have any... The, okay, uh, the, in the uh, D.C. versus Heller uh, oral arguments, the guy representing D.C., your side of the argument, essentially, his name is Mr. Dellinger, and he was talking about how the militia was uh, the, the polity in the sense of Verkudo or Kides, and, you know, the people are the militia, the militia are the people. In the United States, the militias back in the day aren't what you think of the militias being back in the day, something that's under the thumb of the legislature. That's what was so shocking about Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16. It, it, on the face of it, gives a tremendous amount of power to the national government to regulate the militias. This worried a lot of people, giving rise to uh, the caveats put in, and we'll ratify this, but we better be having a Bill of Rights coming along later. Um, anyway, uh, it was shocking, as he rightly says, that, that the national government would have this much power. The precise kind of thing, kind of thing that the American, uh, the American states 
were trying to get away from when they left England, when they stopped being colonies and became states. So, uh, the, the power existing in the way that it was created a lot of chaos of the day. And so that's why they wanted to put in our, uh, what became the Second Amendment. Uh, now, Mr. Dellinger um, was talking about the Verkuta Vir, uh, Urquidez case and being the polity and how that's what the militia is. That's not exactly true either. But putting, putting that off to the side, the militia back in the day, unlike what you think of it, was composed of, much in the same way it is today, an organized component and an unorganized component. Back in the day, the militias that fought against the, the British Army, were, many of them were private militias, completely independent of the power of the state. Uh, the Minutemen being uh, a great example of this. Minutemen are famous. They were a private militia. They were not under the heel of the legislature. When, when the legislature wanted them to do something, like in uh, some of the colonies in Massachusetts to get together, and they, want the, they wanted the private militias to do something, they would have a big meeting, have a powwow, and they would vote on recommendations to make to the militia. And the militia would read it and say, okay, we'll do that, or, yeah, we ain't doing that, go fuck yourselves. Uh, the militias organized themselves, voted in voted on their own officers, who in turn voted on the more senior officers. They supplied their own weaponry, you know, they were bringing their own artillery pieces, which is still legal today, by the way. Uh, there are videos here on YouTube where you can go look at people <laughs> playing with their artillery pieces, which I guess is great for self-defense. Uh, defense of the home. Honey! Oh my god, burglars! You... Freeze, mother bitches! Margaret! Get the artillery piece and haul that bastard out here! Yeah, the big, the big motherfucker, the howitzer one. Yeah, come on! All right, mother bitches, bring it! <laughs> I guess that's how that goes, I don't know. But it's funny. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, organized and unorganized. So you had some militias that were completely at the, the uh, beck and call of the government, and then other ones that worked completely independently with the government, though very frequently working alongside the organized militia. And that's still true today. If you look up 10 U.S.C. 311, that defines the types of militias. You have the unorganized and the organized militia. The organized militia is the National Guard. The unorganized militia is everybody else, all able-bodied males uh, between 17 and 45 who are citizens of the United States or have averred that they want to become citizens of the United States. And all women, uh, all female citizens, though not female non-citizens who want to become citizens, just female citizens proper, who are part of the organized militia, which is the National Guard, except as otherwise provided in 32 U.S.C. 313. So you go look at, what, what the hell is 32 U.S.C. 313? You go look up 32 U.S.C. 313, and you see that it's age restrictions that expands it. So it's, uh, it talks about age of eligibility to be in the military, and uh, one of them is talking about people who have formerly served in the military are eligible, uh, what is it, from age 45 to uh, up to age 64, and so that's incorporated into being part of the militia. It's all able-bodied males who are citizens or who want to become citizens between 17 and 45, all males who have served in the military up to age 64, and all women who serve in the National Guard. That's the militia. And he likes. They've forgotten that. They get very angry when you point that out. They, they claim to be strict constructionists when you actually read the amendment back to them, their heads explode. Okay. Well, I'm not a conservative. Uh, my head's not exploding, and I don't know any conservatives who are that stupid. And I know quite a few. Uh, not the straw conservatives that you've conjured into existence. So militia is the first part. The second part, they say, there is being necessary to the security of a free state. State. Now, that's very interesting. Cause it's it is, because the relationship between the states and the federal government were com was completely different uh, back in the day. Back before the Civil War. Hartman points out it originally did not say that. It had the word country instead. Legislative history is dubious. It's like going to a dinner party to find your friends. You look over everybody's shoulder and go, oh, that, you know, anyway, whatever. Um, if we really want to bring legislative history into this, then your propositions were explicitly rejected by the first Congress, the one that proposed the amendments that were sent to the states and then by them ratified the votes, now the Bill of Rights. So it was 1789. And there was like a big powwow in the first Senate. This is in its journal. I'll put a link to it below so you can you know, double check behind me. And it says, uh, on motion to amend uh, Article the Fifth by inserting these words, quote, for the common defense, end quote, next to these words, quote, bear arms, end quote, it passed in the negative. 
they considered your your dubious propositions. They thought about it. They debated it. They had a big, you know, convocation where they talked it out, and they said, you know what? No. Just no. We don't want that. It isn't just for the common defense. It is a freestanding right that inheres in the human being for existing and being a citizen. Unfortunately, they didn't include blacks. And by the way, a lot of whites in the South, too, don't forget indentured servants, uh, another name for slaves, were uh, not that uncommon either. The state. For some reason, when people talk about slavery, they want to forget the white people who were slaves. Let me show you the uh, first draft of the Second Amendment by James Madison. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. So that was the entirety of the first... Right, they wanted to make it clear that the militias belonged to the states and they could be activated by the federal government in certain cases, in cases of insurrection or... Uh, there are a lot of conditions that go into it, like the governors of the states can apply and say, hey, we need help. Anyway, they belong, to, they belong to the states, and it is made up of the citizens of that state who aren't disqualified for whatever reason. Felons, uh, people who have done other notorious crimes, and certain other people were prohibited from uh, having firearms. But the militia was pretty much every able body swinging dick male uh, who could you, you could be you could be imprisoned or fined if you as a private citizen did not have firearms as mandated by the militia acts. Draft of the Second Amendment. They changed the word country to state after significant debate on the issue because they said, no, no, the point is for the states to be able to protect themselves. Not the people in the states. Bullshit. Absolute bullshit. That's why contemporary provisions, uh, constitutions in the states would say things like, for the common defense and defense of self. It, it is axiomatic. It's not it's that there is a right to self-defense that adheres in, in existence. That, because that is true, when you, when you uh, ratchet that up to the level of society, society has a right to defend itself because the individual people in it, all of them, have a right to defend themselves. It was the states had a right. The, as Dellinger pointed out, the people are the militia and the militia are the people. And as Robert Peel pointed out, one of the, the father of law enforcement in the United Kingdom, which has some relationship to modern police in the United States, the people are the police and the police are the people. It's simply the, the police wear uniforms and the people don't. And it is a, the, the duties of law enforcement are the same as the duties and rights of individual citizens. It's incumbent upon them to look after their own safety and well-being in the same sense that it is for the people they've hired to have a day-to-day -day care for that to do it in their stead. These are the so-called Peelian principles. Not individuals, for the states to protect themselves against the United States of America. And internal strife, which, by the way, could include slaves in a rebellion, or it could it could include include non-slaves in a rebellion. You know, they were they were like, hey, we'll have a rule that says if there's a rebellion, we can put it down. Now, uh, some people point out at this at this juncture of the conversation that well, the the United States had had a rebellion, and the, look, the the founders clearly understood the distinction between. A revolution and a rebellion. A rebellion is an unlawful resistance to just power, and what they did was a lawful resistance, well, maybe even unlawful, but a just resistance to unjust power. Whoa, okay, now that's a totally different interpretation than what we have today. So what you call a slave rebellion, I call a slave revolution. Unfortunately, they failed. We say, ah, oh, no, it doesn't mean... That is to say that it was a just resistance to unjust power. It doesn't mean militia. It just means, well, I get to have a gun. I get to have a gun. We all get to have guns. It means both, you fucking moron. No, it doesn't say that. It says in order for a state to protect itself, it must have a well-regulated militia who must be armed because if the militia... And the militia are all the people in the state who must be armed in order to be a militia. I mean, as I mentioned, they had paid attention to retards like you, the king of England, not say, hey, you can have a militia, fine, but just give me all your weapons. Is an armed, well, then it can't protect itself. So let's go to Patrick Henry. Now, Patrick Henry was in principle opposed to slavery, but in reality... My, my favorite quote on slavery comes from Thomas Jefferson, and he said it's like holding a wolf by the ears. You can't keep holding it, 
but you also can't let it go. In other words, you've, put your, you've gotten yourself into a catch-22. You can't maintain this enterprise, and yet you can't get rid of it. So what do you do? No matter what course of action you choose, it's going to lead to mass bloodshed. And that was one of the unfortunate compromises that was made uh, to form this country. Of course, if that compromise hadn't been made, this country would have been formed, in the, at least in the way that it is. Unless, of course, maybe we'd manifest destiny our way down south in addition to out west. Not opposed to slavery. He wanted to conti have it continue for practical reasons. Yeah. It's logistically difficult. You've got a lot of pissed off people you've been abusing for a long time. I don't think you can say, them's just jokes. I don't know how you split that baby, but here's how he did it. In, uh, did so. If it's actually pretty easy to split that baby. I think this is an unjust and immoral system. However, the people we've been unjust and immoral to might be slightly pissed off at us, and maybe if we disarm them all, that might not work out so well for us. The purpose of the Second Amendment. In the debates, uh, when they were arguing over this issue, he said, let me hear call your attention to that part, Article 1, Section 8 of the proposed Constitution, which allowed the United States to have an army, uh, which gives the Congress power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such a... And one of the Federalist responses to this kind of reasoning was to say, look, you don't need a Bill of Rights. This is agitating for the Bill of Rights, and in particular something like the Second Amendment. Uh, now, uh, this is in Federalist 84, I think. I don't remember it off the top of my head. One of the Federalist Papers, one of the, the later ones. And it would say, look, you don't need a Bill of Rights because it, it presents to dishonest motherfuckers in the future like, like this guy, like the Young Turks. That's what they... I'm sure that's how they... they that's what... Because that was a consequence of, of that kind of reasoning, that must be what they specifically meant, right? So anyway, that along in the, in the future, some moron's going to come by, some dishonest shitbag, and he's going to say, look, obviously... If the power to regulate this, if the power to control this didn't exist, it, there would not be an amendment uh, addressing this. Because, as the argument went, why write an amendment denying, mentioning that the government can't do something when it wasn't given a power to do that thing in the first place? Nowhere in there is it able to disarm the people. It has to provide rules uh, for training and arming them. It has to provide the arms. It has to provide for the calling forth. It can't disarm the people because it has to find ways to arm them. It has to come up with rules about how to do that, which surely a rule that mandates you do something precludes you from doing its negation. Anyway, so uh, that's how the argument went. We see that in the fullness of time, that was a very good argument because people like you always show up to go, hey, look, Look at the Second Amendment. It, sure, it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but what that really means is that something that the people put into the Constitution to restrict the power mentioned in Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16, to make it clear that the power is not as expansive as it seemed to be, so we wanted to contract that. The fact that they put that in there to contract it really means they expanded it, and the Congress can do whatever it would fucking like. No, you fucking retard. It is a government of limited powers. It is a government of specific enumerated powers. When people talk about structural provisions of the Constitution, legal eagles talk about this. What they mean is that there are certain parts of the Constitution that address certain topics. And if you find something in that section, it's meant to do something where if it existed somewhere else, it would operate in a different way, perhaps. For example, Article 1 is the Congress, Article 2 is the Presidency, Article 3 is the Supreme Court, and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time uh, authorize. Article 1, Section 8 is the part of the Constitution that says, Hey, Congress, listen up, listen up. Great news! Mirabile dictu! Here are your just, proper powers. These are your proper duties. These are your proper functions. This is your proper sphere of operation. All needful and appropriate legislation to bring into fruition uh, these particular powers. Knock yourself out. Uh, as was pointed out in D.C. against Heller by then Solicitor General Paul Clement against Mr. Dillinger's argument, he says it's kind of an embarrassment for Mr. Dillinger and anybody who wants to give uh, the Second Amendment the exclusive mil uh, militia purpose, related uh, purpose, because if that were the case, then Madison would surely have proposed it as an amendment to Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16, but he didn't. He proposed it as an amendment to Article 1, Section 9. What is Article 1, Section 9? That says Congress, stop! All that shit we said in Article 1, Section 8 are your proper duties, powers, and functions. This section says these aren't your proper concern. Hands off, Congress. Stay away from this shit. Not your business. None of your concern. Go the fuck away. Do not enter beyond your just 
powers, except for um, the Great Writ, which can be suspended in actual cases of insurrection and rebellion when the public safety may require it. But generally, it's the section of the Constitution that says, Congress, stop! You can't do this! That's where the Second Amendment was put. Of them as maybe now when when you have people who propose that to put it in the section of the constitution that says government go away what you say that means is they said government do whatever you want and that's because you're a dishonest shitbag and i really hope you take up the following two hobbies hopefully in conjunction uh enjoying long fast drives on winding mountain roads and drinking heavily you would do the world a favor Lloyd in the service of the United States. By this, sir, you see that their control over our last and best defense is unlimited. If they neglect or refuse to discipline or arm our militia, they will be useless. The state I, love the way, I love the way you emphasize our. First of all, the word is our. But anyway, the, our militia? Well, who, who else's militia would have... How come they're not doing things with the English militia? Those rat bastards. ...do neither this power being exclusively given to Congress. The power of appointing officers over men not disciplined or armed is ridiculous, so that this pretended little remains of power left to the states may, at the pleasure of Congress, be rendered negatory. And for all of these reasons is precisely why the right is reposed not in the militia, but in the individual. That's why it says the right of the people, not the right of the militia. You know, the, the framers of the Constitution were a little bit smarter than you. When they wanted to talk about the militia, they wrote the word, the militia. When they wanted to talk about the people, they wrote the, the term, the people. When they wanted to talk about the office of the presidency, they talked about the office of the presidency. When they wanted to talk about the Supreme Court, they talked about the Supreme Court. When they wanted to talk about the Chief Justice of the United States, they talked about the Chief Justice. When they wanted to talk about the House of Representatives, they talked about it. When they wanted to talk about the Senate, they talked about the Senate. When they wanted to talk about the Congress collectively, they talked about the fucking Congress. They knew how to say what it is that they meant to say. And surprisingly enough, they were able to actually do that. The m so, he's saying, if you say that the United States Congress can organize an army or national militia, and they can arm it, and then you allow them the right to unarm our state militias, well, then our state militias become pointless. Our state militia... Yeah, so even if the Congress passes such a law that, that says no more militias, the people themselves, who are the actual militia, still have their guns so they can say, yeah, we disagree, sir. Not so fast. Yo, Kirito Taco Bell, whatever they used to say back in the day. Hold, hold your horse and buggy carriage, sir. We'll have none of that shit. This must be armed for two reasons. One is to have a defense against the United States of America. Don't make me pull up my shoe phone and call Hugh and cry. And two, so that we could have our slave patrols. That is what the militia in the South was predominantly used for. No, it wasn't. The militia then was probably predominantly used for the same thing it's predominantly used for now. Not a lot. Some of the, the slave patrols were taken from the militia. Others were on the explicit payroll of the state as agents of the state, and some were kind of private organizations. In fact, the first militias in America were started to put down slave rebellions. That's a fucking lie. Or it's something that you should know better if you know anything about the history of militias in the United States and the history of slavery of the United States. The first slaves entered the United States, or what became the United States, the colonies, in 1619. The first militia was started, uh, called a train, bran uh, train ban, in 1607 in Jamestown, which bled over directly from train bands in England started in the 15th, the 16th, the 16th century, back in the 1500s. So it's funny that uh, they started something to put down something that couldn't possibly have existed when it was started. There were no slaves here at the time. Hey, Frank. Yes. I think we should start us a militia. What's that? It's a, it's something you have so you can put down slaves. What's a slave? It's something we don't have yet. But in about a decade and some change, we're going to employ, import our first 22 slaves and some indentured, indentured servants. And we better have this on... <laughs> we better have a whole militia on hand in case those 22 slaves <laughs> form a rebellion. Like I said, there were militias in the North. And if, for example, George Washington had to put down 
uh, a bit of a rebellion started by a militia in Pennsylvania. Almost 200 years after the first militia was here. It was about militias. Okay. Now, in the South, though, they had this <laughs> issue. Now, George Mason... Now, modern law enforcement in the United States bled directly out of the slave patrols in the South, Night Watch in the North, and I mentioned something about uh, P uh, Pelian principles, so let me tie that all together. If you look back at etchings and then photographs of law enforcement throughout uh, the colonies and into the states throughout history, what you notice is that it's not until the latter part of the 19th century that you start routinely seeing police officers or law enforcement officers or patrols being depicted as carrying firearms. Uh, yet, yeah, it was often carried, and by often I only mean to say that it happens with some frequency, uh, a frequency less frequent than what you would need to be to say that, that it's the majority, but it happens with, with you know, some, some dependable regularity, even though it's not uh, the, the standard rule of the day. Slave patrols did not typically, at least to the extent that I can determine, go armed. It wasn't the standard issue, even though they weren't issued, it was whatever you brought along. Now, in the 1850s, thereabouts, the debate that had been happening in England in the 1820s with Robert Peel, the Bow Street Runners, giving rise to the Bobbies and whatnot, and his so-called Peelian principles of law enforcement. The gun issue was resolved in the United States completely opposite to what it was resolved uh, to be in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, the principle of Robert Peel's organization was they should be uniformed and unarmed, and uh, they will gain their just and proper powers from their interaction with the public, uh, one of, I think it was his ninth principle, uh, it could be eighth maybe, that, uh, uh, shit, it was one of them, that uh, they do, they, they gain the, public, the public's confidence not by pandering to the public, but by their impartial, professional, courteous administration of the laws, where they take no role in the making of the policies of the laws, and they enforce them without passion and prejudice, readily giving courtesy to all people irrespective of their actual class, uh, rendering assistance to all those in need and being ready to, at a moment's notice, make uh, the ultimate sacrifice for the community, for the, the, the people whom they're sworn to protect, uh, whenever such sacrifices may be required for the maintenance of those people's lives, their livelihood, their safety, and whatnot. And that was something I took to heart uh, when I was in law enforcement, and that was that every day before I'd go to work, I'd always make sure that I am prepared today to die for no particular reason, because it's what I've sworn to do. And uh, I, I can honestly say that every day I went to work, I was able to, to uh, be, I was, I was prepared to do that. I was always an, able to answer yes to that question. Am I prepared to die today for no particularly important reason? Yes. Yes, I am. And that was true right up until the day I left. It's not why, I didn't leave because I suddenly had answered no to that question and left for other reasons. But uh, I took that very seriously. The uniform thing uh, was resolved in the same way there as it was here, but with different emphasis from law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement here very much opposed to having uniforms. They thought it would be a, <laughs> something that people would mock them for. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> when you go back to the early, you know, back into the 1600s and the 1700s, cops getting shot or law enforcement or patrols being shot at and killed or killed generally wasn't something that they worried about. It wasn't a problem. The first recorded killing of a patrolman, a law enforcement officer in the United States, or the colonies in the United States, is in 1791 in New York. It was a, a sheriff, I think, who was killed, uh, serving in a, a writ of ejectment, if I recall correctly. And he was killed. First law enforcement officer in, our, in the American history that died was in 1791. Uh, he was shot and killed, by the way. So, right through uh, the 18... 50s. Uh, it, it, okay, it has always been true throughout the colonies and the states that law enforcement could carry firearms. It's true because everybody else could. <clears throat> um, their powers are derivative. Their rights are derivative. By the way, this is another Pelian principle. Uh, law enforcement is only exercising in the set of the citizens things the citizens have a duty and a right to do all on their own. It's incumbent upon each individual to see to in his own right. You, uh, you see to your own safety, your own comfort, your own provisions, you, you know, all these kinds of things. But the, no one can be vigilant all the time, so we'll have a professional uniform police force uh, whose only function is to see to those things uh, as, an, as an auxiliary augment to the citizenry, of which the, the police are a part. The police are the citizens, and the citizens are the police. It's just one wear uniforms and one don't. Anyway, back to the American system. 
uh, they, were, they weren't issued by departments until the 1800s. They weren't standardized until the, the 20th century. I think Res, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the first one to, to do the standardization. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, completely different uh, systems in the United States and the United Kingdom with some commonalities. And the, the militias, as I mentioned, were started in the early 1600s. Slavery started sometime after that. And you can trace quite readily through history slave patrols giving you know, morphing straight into uh, contemporary uniform police forces. Oh, and the firearms thing. That was finally resolved in, I think, the 1850s, and it, it's not been controversial since then that officers carry firearms, though the particular uses of firearms uh, from time to time are controversial. And with that, I think I'm going to just turn off this disingenuous shitbag before he starts uh, quote mining uh, a founding father to talk about all founding fathers. And uh, for a longer conversation on that, which is quite well done, I again commend your good graces. Uh, vernaculous video. Alright, you guys have a great day.